Well, good morning. I am so glad that we are together as we continue our journey through Exodus. And as you know, we are focusing our time fully to understand who our God is. And so as you can see, our title is This is Our God, and we're using Exodus for that platform. And I want to remind you that last week, Pastor Jeremy walked us through how God is purposeful. He has things that he asks us to participate in, and he calls us to, and there's a purpose behind everything he does. It's such a a cool moment. And I remember last week, this, this first big picture is, the Israelites are about to leave Egypt. So if you have not been a part of this journey so far, I want to encourage you to go back and watch the the rest of the messages that led up to today. But they're about to head out of Egypt. And then before the departure, God lays out for them this incredible moment where he says, I want you to remember that I am God. I am number one and I am holy. And so therefore, there was a feast of unleavened bread, this opportunity to remember this great, great deliverance that's going to take place and we're going to be getting into today. But also they were called to set aside their firstborn, to release their firstborn to God as a reminder that he should be first in our life. And so as you pick up from that story, I want to remember that this celebration, that this opportunity before their departure was all about celebrating God's deliverance. And so today we're going to get into Exodus chapter 13, starting in verse 17. And we are going to look at the powerful display of our incredible God today. What an opportunity as we look at his word. And so as we've been walking through Exodus, we've been looking at who our God is. And really the picture I want you to hear today is we've been looking at his glory All the words on the screen, all these words we've been walking through are attributes of his glory, his sovereign nature, meaning he's in control of all things, his compassion, that he is the I am, that he's powerful, he's faithful, he's the one true God, he is our redeemer, he is purposeful in all things that he does. And today we are going to begin focusing on our God is our leader, our God is our leader leader. I want you to keep that in front of you. And so I want to ask you this question. If that statement is true, is God your leader? Just take that for a moment. And I hope that if you're at the Ark or if you're at South Umpqua, that you're saying, yes, he's our leader. And because of the stories of the Bible, as we look at the text, as we see how God has moved through history, we can know that he is trustworthy. He is a trustworthy leader. We can have confidence that his ways are better than our ways. His thoughts are better than our thoughts. And his desire is that he wants to lead you where he wants to take you. Maybe not necessarily where you want to go right now, though. But he wants to lead you where he wants to take you. And so I want to start with this question. If God is your leader, how's your followership? In other words, how are you doing at following his leading? And so I I grabbed uh, Moses' words out of Deuteronomy here, and I thought this is a perfect definition of what followership is. It says, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him followership. This is out of Deuteronomy as Moses lays out what it means to follow. And of course, in his time frame, in the, in the season of God's plan where he was living, there were commandments specific that he had to keep. And as we come to faith in Christ, he says, your commandment now is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so in this definition, let me focus on one piece. Do you obey his voice? Do you serve him? Do you hold fast to him? Do you fear him? Do you revere him as the great God who loves us? So how's your followership? When you came in today, as you gathered wherever you're gathering, let me ask you this question. Were you going, oh man, I really like when Jason teaches. It's Craig again. 
Or, oh, I wish it was Drew. Or, oh, I sure wish Jeremy was teaching. Or do you say, oh, great, it's Craig. That's great, wonderful. But I'm asking a bigger question. Are those things that, is, is that all it takes to throw you off of your followership? Or maybe the song that was sung wasn't the song you really like to worship to. And so therefore you, you get distracted easily. Or maybe the people around you, maybe your friends aren't here. You had to sit in different seats for goodness sakes. And you're thrown off and now God is no longer leading you because your mind is so, so distracted. You've allowed your mind to be distracted and now you're in this place where you're just thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. How's your followership You see, I believe that our worship and our followership must be focused on God in all circumstances and in all situations, regardless of what's going on around me. And I think that's what our definition today really leans us into. Do you hold fast to him when things aren't going the way that you think they should go? So let's take that idea. Let's walk through the story in Exodus today, starting in chapter 13, verse 17. And let's apply some of this as we look at how the Israelites respond to God's leading and ask ourselves, how are we responding to his leading? So follow with me if you would. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. Remember where we left off. They're just about to leave Egypt. The the promise of God is now being fulfilled. And verse 17 says, when Pharaoh let the people go. How cool. We start right there. Remember, he would go before Moses. He'd go before Pharaoh. He'd say, let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh would say no. But today, verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Our God is so good. He says, look, if I take them through the Philistine land, they're going to get in battles. And I'm not ready and they're not ready for them to do that. And so they're gonna, we're gonna t- I'm going to take them around the Philistines. God has so much care for them and so much understanding of what their needs are. He says, I'm not going to take them that route. And then in verse 18, it says, but God let the pe- led the people around by the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. So they left fully equipped. They've got all the armaments they need. They've got many of the things that they, their, their possessions and, the, and of the, the herds and the, all the things that they've collected that God has provided. And verse 19 says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, and Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones with you from here. And remember just a moment, Joseph. If you need to learn more about who Joseph is, I want to encourage you to go back to Genesis chapter 37 and start the Joseph story there. But this is the Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers eventually raised into the high courts through Pharaoh of his day and uh, was an instrumental part in allowing the Israelites to survive a famine. So go look more at that. But these are the bones of that Joseph. Verse 20 says, And they moved from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. This is an amazing beginning to our story today. And I wanna pause and just look at a couple of key points before we get into the next part of our our message. And, And the first is it says, the Lord went before them, that the Lord is the leader. The Lord goes and and creates the path in which they will follow. But there's this really unique piece where it says he was a cloud to them, a cloud by day and a cloud and a pillar of fire by night. And there's a beautiful picture here. And I was was kind of doing some study and referencing uh, what did this really mean? Because in my mind, I often looked at this little white puffy thing in the distance like, oh, there's God, and let's follow God. But, but let's keep in mind what we're dealing with. This is the, the entire people, the Israelites. 
And so there's scholars who have all kinds of studies about how many would that be, and the scriptures give us great insight into that. And I'm going to use the kind of a round number of three million people. Just imagine for a moment, three million people are going to go on a camping trip. (laughs) Uh, How would you like to lead that? Could you imagine just leading, let alone the congregation you're sitting in, that you're in charge of those people? Now multiply that. Let me give you a picture of what does 3 million mean? Well, Douglas County is our population, you know, from Diamond Lake all the way down to the coast. We're about 112,000. So get all the people of Douglas County and then get 26 more Douglas counties and say, we're going to go on a camping trip. Let's go. Can you imagine? Uh, What a nightmare. And so now you have this moment because I'm sure you could imagine a little bit of grumbling or a little bit of exhaustion, maybe some hunger, maybe some thirst, maybe some rebellion, maybe some people who want to walk faster and some who want to walk slower. But God says, I am the leader. And so he says, I am going to do this in a unique way. And so look what it says as it recaps the story with me. Back to Psalm 105 for a moment. Look at this. Psalm 105, verse 39 says this, he spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give them light by night. So God creates a cloud over them. And what a beautiful picture, a cloud in the daytime, a cloud that provides fire at night. And this, I believe, is how God could move three million people, three million people. Think about this for a moment. If it's a hot desert, upwards of 120 degrees, and there's a cloud that provides shade, if you move the cloud and you're standing in the sun, how much motivation do you need to move back into the shade? I'm curious about if this is how God's plan was. It seems likely that he's like, hey, now it's time to move. And the shade moves and the people move. And the same would be true at night. There's light that's provided. And, and as the light moves, they follow that light. And I, it doesn't say this, but I would imagine that on a cold night in the desert, and deserts get cold. I've spent time in Africa in the desert and Eastern Oregon in the desert. And the coldness of, of evening can be pretty bitter. And imagine that there was some warmth perhaps that even came from this pillar of fire. So God, in his incredible mercy and leadership style, says, here's how I will lead you. And it's real simple. And so my question for you is this, what does it take to move you? As the Lord leads, what does it take to move you? If he's your leader, what does it take to move you? Recently, I was in the Snake River or in a boat on the Snake River, and the Snake River area gets very hot. So it was about 104 degrees one day, and we're sitting on a boat, and we're sitting on anchor, and the wind is blowing a little bit so that the boat would swing, and there's a top on this boat. And so as I sat there, we would swim a little bit to cool off, but I'd get tired of swimming, so I'd go sit in the boat and fish and enjoy the scenery, and then the boat would swing, and the sun would begin to move into my position, and now I'm out of the shade, and do you know what my response was? Uh, I think I'll move. (laughs) It's time to move. So I would move over into the seat where the shade was, and then the boat would swing back, and I'd be back in the sun again. So I kept going back and forth between the seats as I could. I think, what a powerful way to move three million people. But what does it take to move you when God is moving you? See, God wants to move you in the direction that he's calling you to, to be like him, so that as you move around others, you can declare his glory by your life. And he often allows discomfort so that you'll follow after him. When that sun, when the the boat swung and the sun would hit my skin, I would be in discomfort. And it didn't take much discomfort for him. Like, I'm out of here. I don't like the sun on my skin. It's hot. Recently, I was really challenged by this idea of what does it take to move you? Um, You know, because of the, the operations of how churches operate, we know that it takes the faithful giving of our body to keep staff going, to keep the mission of God moving, to, to take care of our missionaries across the sea, to provide for some of the needs of, of our local populations. 
And I realized that as we were challenged by some of the shortfalls that we're experiencing, and it's not because of the lack of people, it's just a need to be challenged again. But you know where my mind went in this? I was really uncomfortable. Because in my mind, I, I lost for a minute the perspective of who's actually in control, to be honest with you. And so I would started thinking, oh, maybe I need to get a job or maybe something needs to change. And, and rather, I think what God was saying was two things. One, do you trust me? Will you follow me? And two, who's in control, Craig? Who provides? Yeah, you may have to get a job, I felt like God said, but that's not today. I will provide for you. And I feel like that discomfort of wanting to take the reins and make things happen, perhaps to help out the greater, the body. I was really challenged in that idea that I think there was some discomfort that comes when we're truly forced to ask the question, do I trust you, God? And as you're moving, will I follow? Will I help also in the giving? Will I increase my giving? Will I trust you, God? What does it take to move you? So as you wrestle with that today, I hope you'll ask the question, what does it take to move you? Are you movable or are you stuck? Are you movable or are you stuck? Well, I want to continue in our story because now the Israelites have left Egypt. Hallelujah. They are, I'm sure, very excited at first. Like most journeys, the first few steps are fantastic until you look out and go, oh man, this is a long journey. And and they're beginning this exciting time. And so I want to give you just a reference on the map of, we're going to be talking today about this incredible moment, the Red Sea crossing. And I put a couple arrows there because my temptation is I want so badly to dive in and talk about all the different possible routes they took. And there's controversy about where they crossed the Red Sea. And we could spend hours looking at all the details and where do they find artifacts and where's this happening? Where could it have been? But I also realize that's what often people do. We get so focused on the details, we forget about the God of those details, our God. And so today I'm going to ask you to Take this challenge, go and study, go watch videos. There's so many resources about Red Sea crossing, artifacts and ideas. But today I wanna focus instead on the God who demonstrated tremendous power as he conquered the Egyptians, as he led the Israelite people into safety. And so let's keep that focus if we could. And so I wanna give you a picture of one of the possible sites where this crossing could have happened because I need you to be in the story. Don't just listen. I want you to be on this beach for a moment. Look at uh, the picture of sand, a large flat basin. Now behind you in this picture would be the Red Sea. And the other side of that Red Sea is about 10 miles away. That's a good journey. (laughs) So behind you is a Red Sea, 10 miles wide, several hundred feet deep, depending on where you are in that position. And then before you, you see mountains and one little passageway. And you may begin to realize you're trapped. You're standing on the beach. You've got your children by your side, your baby on your back, and you know the Egyptians are coming. And you begin to wonder, God, what are you doing? I thought you were leading us, and I believe we're going to see that God is absolutely in control. So let's get into chapter 14, if you would. Chapter 14 says, Then Moses, excuse me, then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Piahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephor. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Quick pause. There's that statement again. God is hardening Pharaoh's heart, but I want to remind you, Pharaoh's heart was already set against God and God is releasing him to what he already desired. Pharaoh considered himself a God. He had no desire to follow our God and God gave him what he wanted. 
and he helped him to harden his heart even more. And the whole purpose, did you catch it? Was that God, our God, would get glory. That he would be seen as the one true powerful God. Such an important understanding. Our leader, our God. And so there they are. They're sitting there and they're, they've got in front of them mountains. Behind them, they have nothing but ocean. And God said, now I'm going to prove to you that I am in control. I want to ask you this question. I've been reading through a book called The Red Sea Rules. There's 10 rules to live by that you'll find coming out of this very story, the crossing of the Red Sea. And the first one I want to challenge you with is the number two rule in the book. It said this, be more concerned for God's glory than for your relief. The Israelites are trapped. There's ocean, there's mountains, there's an army coming Are they concerned about God's glory being on display, his power, his might? Or are they more concerned about their comforts, their reliefs, their needs? Because God is going to provide. He's promised it to them. But I think you can imagine with baby on back and child by your side, fear would overtake you. It's difficult sometimes to see God's leading when we perhaps feel trapped. How do you respond when things are going difficult for you, when things aren't going the way that you thought they should? How are you responding when there's suffering and fear and pain in your life? Does your response point to you or point to God? I know that is not an easy statement and is not to minimize. God wants you to have comfort, but he says, I will be your comfort but he also says that there will be difficult times. And and I am just like you. I want comfort. I don't like it when it's too hot. I don't like it when it's too cold. I want my wife to be healed. I want our church to thrive. I want to see things go well. I want to put my feet in the sea and hang out on the beach. But how's your followership? If God is your leader, are you living your life as a follower in such a way that your desire is every time you see God working in your life that you give him glory, that people see God in you? Or are you trying to find ways to find comfort and relief apart from God? How's your followership? Let's get back into our story, chapter 14. I'm gonna bring you into verse five now. Verse five says this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we've done that we've let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamped by the sea by Piahiroth in front of Beelzephor. So there they are. The army is coming. And it's so interesting that Pharaoh's with them and he is enraged. And the people are now, it says that their their attitude changed. Like, what's going on? Why did we let these people go? Verse 10, it says, when Pharaoh drew near to the people of of Israel, excuse me, when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. Here's the moment. You're on the beach. The army is coming. And it's understandable that they're scared. Armies of Pharaoh were well trained. And coming toward them were 250,000 or more soldiers with over 600 chariots, with trained fighters, swords and spears and arrows. And you have no way of escape. The sea at your back, the mountains to your front, but you have one God. And look at verse 11. 
After it says, the people feared greatly and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, they said to Moses, verse 11, it is, be is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What a great leader moment. Um, hey, Moses, is there not enough dead people? Is there not enough graves in Egypt so you brought us out here? They've, it's like they've completely forgotten <laughs> the plagues and all that God's demonstration was. But I don't think you and I are any different. It doesn't take us too far from the miracle of God until we start to question him in our life. And then they say this, what have you done to us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. In other words, we'd rather stay in slavery than be challenged right now. This is not okay. Oh, they're confused. They're frustrated. I understand it. I have compassion for them, but I can't help but keep thinking, don't you remember what you just observed? Continuing halfway through verse 12, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And look at Moses's response. This is so powerful. Look at his response. And the, Moses said to the people, fear not, Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. Moses would say, our God fights for us. Our God fought for us and he will fight again. And I wanna tell you today, our God fought for us Look at what Moses said one more time. And Moses said, fear not, stand firm. If God is your leader, let me challenge you real quick. Fear not and stand firm. See the salvation from the Lord, which he will work for you today and has already worked out. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The bondage you were in, the slavery you are part of to sin, you will never need to be a part of again. Verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. This is Moses' statement of a transformed man, a man who struggled, who fought and resisted following what God was telling him, you're the guy, you're gonna be the one to go to Pharaoh. And now we see him standing in confidence as a transformed man, aware of God's power and faithful to follow him. So do you follow well? Jesus is the way. Remember, Jesus says, this is, I am the way. I've already defeated death. Do you trust me? If you put your faith in me, will you continue to follow me? He's already made a path for us. He laid down his life for us. What an interesting parallel. God's about to fight and defeat the Egyptian army. And Jesus says, I defeated the greatest army of all, sin and death. But I didn't do it with sword. I did it by laying my life down. We have an incredible God and he fought for us. Let's continue in our story on verse 15 of chapter 14. So here they are, just get back to the picture for a moment. They're ready. The army is coming. Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. Pay attention to that statement. This is gonna come up. Dry ground is important. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord then I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Moses, raise your staff. It's time. Moses, in obedience, raises his staff. And as you perhaps have never heard the story, or if you have, God is going to do something incredible. Verse 19. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. This cloud encamped around and covered the Israelites. 
And there was a cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. In other words, this cloud lit up for the Israelites what they would see. And it separated the army from them. Look at the power of God on display in verse 21. Then Moses stretched his hand out over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground third time, and waters being a wall to them, to the right and to the left. Let's pause. I want you to imagine right now, go into some place where there's a lake, get a big pump and pump the water out of that lake. And how long is it going to take before you have dry ground? You see, God is powerful and he knows they're going to need sure footing. And so he is the rock by which they will walk. He dries the ground. And the second thing, I want you to look up in the ceiling for a second. At the campus where you're at, just look up and imagine that the walls of your building were water up to the peak of the ceiling. And then multiply that by hundreds of more feet potentially. And imagine the pathway that God is blazing a trail through and it's completely dry ground. What an wondrous moment. You see, God put the Israelites, I believe, in a place where they absolutely could do nothing so that he could do everything. So he could be on display. So his glory would accomplish the purpose that it said earlier, that the Egyptians would know that he is the Lord. And in your followership, my question is, as you respond, does your life Give glory to God so others know that he is the Lord, the Lord of your life. Verse 23, excuse me, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning, uh, watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. Chaos, sluggish movement. They can't seem to move forward. They're stuck. They're scared. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. The Israelites have passed safely, crossing 10 miles perhaps across the Red Sea on dry ground. And they're standing on the opposite shore, looking back and here it is, the moment. So Moses stretched out his hand, verse 27, over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled into it, and the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The water returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them in the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. We'll finish at verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power of the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. And I want to conclude today with this statement, our God saves. Our God saves. When everything looked hopeless, our God saves. When you feel surrounded by troubles, when you think there is no path or of escape, when you think for sure the end is near for you, our God saves. We have one God and he is powerful, one leader and he deserves all the glory. And look at what it says again, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And I wanna challenge you today to this. They saw God moving. They saw the power of God on display, the protection that he gave them, the path of escape. He provided everything he promised. And we should be able to take that truth and remember what Christ said. He says, stand firm in me. You see, when I defeated death and sin, Christ would say, I freed you also. 
just like the Israelites were freed from Egypt, the slavery of Egypt. I freed you from the penalty of sin that you so deserved. I took that for you. And secondly, I have freed you from the power of sin over you. I have given you the means of escape because of my blood, because of my life that I laid down for you. And and although you have not yet reached your promised land, I give you that promise. You will be free from the presence of sin eternally with me in heaven when your earthly wandering is done. Our God saves. And so I conclude with Number three, Red Sea rule, acknowledge your enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. I know that life is tough. I know. (laughs) I'm not without the same challenges that you experience. I know the battle is real. There are temptations that pull at you daily. There are distractions that keep you from looking at the Lord to, to cling fast to him, to hold him tight. There's suffering that can take us off our game, that can completely spin us around and cause so much hurt and sorrow. But my question remains, how's your followership? You see, God will surround you. He has covered you. He is leading you. And so will you follow? Love our story today. I hope that you can continue wrestling as we go into our week about how well are we following. So I'm gonna release to our campuses and let each of the campus pastors challenge you today with our next steps and our our, uh, transformational moment. Thank you, guys. Well, you stuck it out with me. And I I tell you, the story for me, I could spend hours (laughs) on this message. And I know you're going, yeah, I know you could. It's very clear. And so I tried my best to compress this time together. But here's what I want you to leave with today. First question I want to ask you, where's God leading you today? Are you aware of God moving in your life? As as he moves, do you sense his movement? And do you follow him is the question. I'd encourage you to cry out to him, to pray to him and say, God, lead me, lead me, take me where you want me to go. The second thing, as you share with your family, and I know sometimes you hear family and you think, well, I don't have children in the house or I never had children or I'm at the grandparenting stage or maybe my spouse is no longer with me. Then who's your other family members? Who cares for you? Who's your immediate fellowship with as the family of Christ? I want to encourage you to share with your family how God has led you and provided for you. Don't forget the incredible movement of God in your life.